I am Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to a video conference edition of the New York Times Close Up. Dozens of cities all across America have been at full boil. The video of an unarmed black man in Minneapolis, George Floyd, dying while in police custody was shocking. The cop who had his knee on Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes has been charged with murder. The brutal incident set off days of violent protests in Minneapolis. Those protests quickly spread all over the country, from Los Angeles to Atlanta, Chicago, Nashville, New York, New Orleans, Louisville, and right outside the White House. It's hard to imagine that racial injustice, police brutality, and inequalities will not become major issues in this year's elections. Throw into the mix what many see as Donald Trump fanning the flames. Here's part of Trump's tweet about the protests, quote, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. The tweet drew sharp rebukes even from some Republicans. Days later, Trump threatened White House protesters with, quote, vicious dogs, then said he's ready to deploy the military in American cities to crack down on demonstrators and looters. How will these hot button issues and Trump's inflammatory response play out politically in this year's election year? Reed Epstein, a political reporter for the New York Times, Clyde Haberman, contributing writer for the Times, Eleanor Randolph, also a contributing writer for the Times and the author of The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg. Reed, you looked at the primary results this past week around the country. Is there anything in those results that would give us a hint of how the pandemic and how these uh, demonstrations about inequality, demonstrations about what happened in Minneapolis are likely to affect the election. I don't think the, the elections this week tell us that much about the protests. Uh, the, the biggest thing I think that we know is that states that pushed to mail voting saw, saw pretty sizable increases in turnout compared to their numbers in their primaries four years ago. Uh, in Iowa, there was a 150% increase in turnout compared to the 2016 primary. Uh, Montana was up 35%. Uh, South Dakota and New Mexico were both up between 10 and 16%. These are all states that made a big push to, to mail ballots to all voters. Uh, and so that's going to be something that is going to be difficult for people in some of these states, particularly Iowa and Montana, where they're going to have competitive Senate races in the fall, to walk back the mail voting push before November, as we've seen President Trump call for. Uh, how much of the impact some of the, the unrest in the cities have had, I think it is a little early to know. Um, we didn't have competitive primaries in the presidential races. Uh, it was fairly localized elections at this point. Um, but the, the mail voting uh, boost to, to participation in these contests is, is the big headline. And the mail voting, though, the voting by mail, we should say, just to be clear, uh, is the increase in that, the increase in voting, what Republicans, particularly what the White House, are concerned about in November, that that vote is likely to be anti-Trump, anti-Republican? Well, from my point of view, yeah. I mean, and I wouldn't even say concerned. I would think that they're damn near terrified. The Republican Party, for many, many, many years now, has been the party of voter suppression. There is no escaping this. They have tried their best to make sure that the fewest number of people who can vote will vote. The people they want to keep away from the polls tend to be minorities, but not exclusively. And despite every survey and study that shows that mail balloting works and the amount of uh, fraud involved is uh, de minimis, uh, they keep pounding this same drum, certainly uh, Trump does. Uh, they did the same thing about um, uh, voter fraud in 2016. Um, Trump claiming there were millions of ballots that were uh, not counted or lost or were fraudulently cast. And he had this um, thuggish guy from Kansas, Chris Kobach, investigated, and he came up predictably with nothing. Uh, so the Republicans are increasingly um, 
an anti-democratic party, anti uh, with the word Democrat with a small d. And I think we need to face this squarely and not dance around it as we tend to do. Um, that we have a president who has fascist tendencies. Uh, that has become very clear. And his son-in-law, when asked would the November election be held uh, as scheduled, kind of waffled on it, said, well, we'll have to see. That, to call that even the C or D answer is, is giving it uh, credit that it doesn't deserve. Well, These are people, anyway, I, I, for the first time in my life, and that includes going through the Vietnam era and the civil rights era and a whole lot of other eras, I fear for our democracy now as I never have. Eleanor, uh, Brett Stevens wrote uh, in the Times the other day that he was left with the sinking feeling that the president is going to find a way to profit from all this politically, profit from the demonstrations going on, going for, uh, profit from the looting going on in the city. But Jamel Bowie also wrote in the Times that if the president is trying to portray himself as a law and order candidate, one difference this time compared to, say, Richard Nixon, is that the president is the incumbent, uh, which makes it harder for him to run as a law and order candidate. He's not the challenger. What do you think, Eleanor? Well, I actually think that that one of the things that Andrew, who knew that I would be praising Andrew Cuomo after all the times I'd criticized him, but I thought he said uh, the right thing. He talked about the, the separation between the the protesters and their cause, which is a good cause, and looters. And he talked about how uh, Trump, one of the things Trump is doing and, and doing very carefully is making sure that the cause disappears and he focuses on the looters. And that will, you know, frankly, everybody, every, most of the political people I know say that will actually help him in November, and it's not—it's not whether he can come, he can rise to rise to the level of Richard Nixon, which I, I don't think he is capable of doing. Uh, but he—he um, he can use that. The one thing is, I was thinking um, that scene in Washington that is so that is so now so powerfully um, seared in our consciousness about. Uh, well, it, maybe they didn't tear gas these uh, protesters in Lafayette Square, but they sprayed something on them to get rid of them, and they ousted all the people from the church so that Trump could come by and raise a Bible. Uh, I don't know how his uh, supporters are going to be able to deal with that. That is just an incredibly ugly scene for um, his Christian base. I don't know how they're gonna cope with that, frankly. Let's talk about that for a minute. We are talking before the weekend, so of course we can be overtaken by events. But Reed, we are hearing for the first time really some Republican voices raising questions about the president's action. We're even hearing the defense secretary talking about against deploying US military troops to keep down, uh, to keep order in the cities. Is there a change going on here that uh, that reflects uh, something, some uh, withering of support for the president, Reid? I mean, I'd be highly skeptical of that. I mean, we, I, we've been through so many episodes like this where something, uh, something ugly and traumatic happens involving the president or something the president's done. And it frankly just hasn't diminished his support among core Republican voters. And you see that in how fellow Republican elected officials conduct themselves. Uh, you know, on, on Tuesday, NBC, uh, Casey Hunt, a reporter for NBC News, asked all the Republican senators heading into a lunch about uh, what had happened Monday night in front of the White House. And almost every single one of them either said they weren't aware of it and hadn't seen it uh, or defended the president. The idea that, that they hadn't been aware of something that had been sort of the forefront of the entire nation, not just political news, but the whole nation The in the preceding 24 hours seemed preposterous. People like Ted Cruz blamed the protesters uh, effectively. And so I think that the idea that we're going to see the president support peel away among Republicans because of this is is just not really 
uh, doesn't really comport with what we've seen in the past. Clyde, it's interesting, as Eleanor said, that uh, we're making a distinction, of course, between protesters and looters, but we're also seeing liberals, progressives, uh, it sounds to me, for the first time, blaming outside agitators. Uh, that's yeah. something new, isn't it? There's a term from the 60s. Uh, I think the 60s, uh, and three of us in this discussion uh, are old enough to have uh, lived through it. Uh, I see parallels, uh, particularly to 1968, um, in, in so many respects, in that 1968 it just had an extraordinary um, collection of events. The, the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, the Paris riots in May, the Columbia riots, the university riots here, uh, the Tet Offensive, which began the year, and uh, on and on. And we're having a similar confluence of, of epic events this time. How will it play out? I'm no uh, prognosticator, but I think that these uh, demonstrations and the looting for sure play in the hands of Trump and his supporters uh, as it did for Richard Nixon back in 1968. I do believe that there are enough people in this country who value order over justice, however justice is defined. And it just needs a little bit of a few percentage points here and there in states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, Michigan, to make the difference. Conversely, how does the pandemic play out by the time November comes around? Um, the president's handling of this has been abysmal um, by my lights and I think many other lights. Uh, and that'll be a countervailing force. But I never, never in any country I've ever covered, and I've covered a fair number of them, uh, regardless of uh, race and ethnicity and all the rest, people like order. And to the degree that uh, we are perceived as uh, in chaos, fairly or not fairly, uh, I think it goes to Trump's benefit. I don't mm -hmm. applaud. Wait, I would, I would jump in there. And Trump is, has been, for three and a half years he's been in office, you know, the opposite of order. And that's partly why we've seen his general election numbers uh, do poorly against Joe Biden, who has essentially run a campaign of, uh, of stability and, and a return to order. You know, if the election were this week, Biden would win and it wouldn't be particularly close. You know, of course, there's five months to go before November, but it's difficult to see Trump turning his brand around from sort of a president of chaos that he's been to someone who represents order, no matter how often he says it. Well, if that's a good point, then Eleanor, I mean, the president has sort of been a tumbler in chief. Uh, he has not been uh, a, a president who knows how to demonstrate empathy and grieve with people in the pandemic. Uh, while Clyde, I think, ordinarily would be right, is that going to work this time uh, when people are looking for, are they looking for law and order? Or are they looking for stability and sort of peace and quiet. Well, you know, that was, that was what I was going to say. There is um, a certain conflict between the issues that the protesters are talking about and the economy. And we're going to see one of the things that's going to happen in New York City on Monday is that the city is going to start to open up. And right now, this, the city I see um, is all boarded up and it's just, you know, it's plywood city, all the, uh, all the windows in, in the, in the, along Fifth Avenue and up uh, to Macy's, they're all boarded up. But Monday, we're supposed to start seeing th this city open up. Now, the conflict between those people who need jobs and those people who want justice or that is a conflict that uh, I think is really important and it's sort of hasn't hasn't played out quite yet. Uh, I think we'll pro probably start seeing it maybe next week. Here in can, I just, can I just add very quickly, if I may, Sam, uh, sure. that Reed is quite right about this being a chaos president, but I think there's a difference between his sort of chaos, which is pulling the U.S. out of various international organizations, ripping up treaties willy-nilly and all the rest, as opposed to disorder in the streets. I think th those are two different forms of chaos uh, that need to be separated. Clyde, let me ask you while you're there, uh, how much of the chaos in the streets do you think is 
a result in part of the pandemic that people are out of work uh, yeah. that they have nothing to do in effect that they are cabin fever and this is an outlet of sorts it's probably for a lot of people uh, indeed an outlet look come monday mo came when monday morning came 40 million of our countrymen and women didn't have jobs to go to that they did three months ago so uh there is a lot of time on hands i'm not dismissing it as simply the act of uh, idlers. The looters are a relatively small number, but uh, we know from bitter experience that small numbers can create tremendous amount of disruption and alter the, the entire dialogue. But it's all coming together. It is also all of these things are disproportionately affecting people of color uh, in, in this country. Uh, police brutality, the um, the effects of the uh, coronavirus and the economic dislocation all affect Latinos and African Americans far more than they do any of the four of us in this conversation. So uh, anyway, how uh, much do you think the events of the past week are likely to affect uh, Joe Biden's choice of a vice president? Uh, nominee. Uh, we're looking at at least two of the possibilities who have been prosecutors. Uh, is that going to make any difference? Uh, uh, is he going to look more toward a person of color? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, the choice in front of Joe Biden at this point is really, does he choose somebody who he thinks he needs their help to win the election? Or is he choosing someone uh, to help him govern? Uh, and Ideally, he would find somebody to do both. Uh, but when you look at the the different candidates in this in the vice presidential runnings, like that's really what it's come down to. And so, if he's looking for someone to help him win the election, uh, he's probably going to pick somebody like Kamala Harris. Uh, that she is she was the most prominent black woman. She was the only black woman in the presidential race. Uh, she's probably the most prominent black woman politician in the country at this at this moment. Uh, and for Biden, who owes his nomination to black voters and needs big turnout in uh, black parts of Milwaukee and Detroit and Philadelphia, uh, she's the obvious choice. Now, he's talked uh, a lot more, uh, talked recently a lot with Elizabeth Warren, uh, who represents sort of the progressive wing of the party. Uh, she's somebody who, of all the contenders, probably has the, the strongest sense of how the government works. And in a moment where uh, Vice President Biden could be taking office with something like 15 to 20 percent unemployment, she's somebody uh, who has thought the longest about sort of implementing big programs to help the most number of people. And so that's it, it feels like the vice presidential choice is coming down between those two wings, uh, those two types of decisions, whether it's someone to help him win or someone to help him govern. Uh, Eleanor, I'd like to uh, to sort of move toward something more positive, at least for progressives. Uh, Steve King of Iowa lost at a five-way Republican primary, and a black woman was elected mayor of Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, are those two isolated events, or do they uh, portend uh, anything positive in that direction? You know, I mean, one of the things I wish the protesters would do is emphasize the importance of, of voting. Because, you know, when I look at these crowds in New York, I look at basically kids and they're, they look like they're 18 to 30, most of them. And that is the age group that doesn't really come out and vote. And so, I mean, um, the, the protesters have been protesting uh, about things um, that are basic and need to be fixed. But uh, I, I keep thinking they need to say they want something. They need to say, this is where we want to go. And that first step has got to be voting, voting for people who agree with them. And I just, I'm, I'm a little disheartened that, um, that they're not talking about this. This is all about anger and protest and, and no solutions about going to the polls and, and starting the process of changing things. Thanks to Reed Epstein, Clyde Haberman, Eleanor Randolph for the New York Times, and coming up next, Pulitzer Prize winning Times op-ed columnist, Nicholas Kristof.
Nick Kristoff has written about the coronavirus pandemic from an array of angles, ranging from the heroic work of our healthcare professionals to Donald Trump's search for a scapegoat. He's also written movingly about the pandemic's impact on people around America and around the world who don't have houses in the Hamptons or country estates to retreat to. Quote, another pandemic is looming on the heels of the coronavirus, a pandemic of starvation, illiteracy, and poverty. We instruct people to protect themselves from the coronavirus by washing their hands with soap and water, but more people worldwide have a cell phone than have the ability to wash their hands at home. Nick Kristoff is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning op-ed columnist for the New York Times. He's also the author with his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn, of the book Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope. Let's start off by asking about the fiery protests around the country this past week. Nick, how much of that is response both to inequality, to the pandemic, and to specifically what happened in Minneapolis? I'm sure that it's indeed fed up by uh, frustrations over the fact that 40 million people are out of work. But I think fundamentally, it struck a chord with so many people to see this horrifying video of racial injustice playing out right in front of one. Um, and I've been struck, I must say, by just how many young people were really furious about what that represented, about you know more than a century of failure of the United States to deliver any kind of equity in criminal justice. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm from a small town in Oregon, in our county seat. There was a, a protest yesterday, and that town is lily white. There were hundreds of people showing up in that little town um, shouting Black Lives Matter. And, you know, this really did have resonance across the country. We started a series, the editorial page of The America We Need. This was the result of the pandemic, even before uh, the, these protests began about police brutality. Uh, and that series, James Bennett wrote, uh, said that there has to be a fundamental choice between defending the status quo and embracing progressive change. Well, it seems like we've always needed to make that fundamental choice What's different this time, and why uh, do you have any uh, better sense that uh, we're likely to make that correct choice? So, Sam, I have a ray of hope, and I, I don't you know whether it will have. be realized. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's partly that inequality of health. So with the United States, for example, we're the only uh, advanced country in the world that doesn't have universal access to health care. We're the only country in the world that doesn't have uh, universal paid sick leave. Now, in normal times of uh, chronic disease, those who get sick, they suffer and die on their own. Today, in a time of infectious disease, every tycoon is vulnerable because of those who don't get access, who don't get paid sick leave. I think that may perhaps change the calculation. And I guess more broadly, I look at you know the cycles in American history, and it seems for 50 years, the US has underinvested in, in human capital and education and healthcare. Uh, and I wonder if that cycle isn't, isn't coming to an end. You saw um, Kansas Republicans a few years ago rebelling because taxes were cut so hard, so much that that their own schools were suffering, and they were saying tax us more. You saw Utah and and Idaho expand Medicaid, and so I wonder if already we weren't beginning to challenge this fifty year trajectory of cutting taxes and cutting benefits, um, and you know the coronavirus may add a little more reason to try to address those inequities. One of the things you've written in the column is that the non-experts are so supremely confident in their predictions about the pandemic, about lots of other things. Is that going to change or is this going to shake them up at all, do you think? Especially as you've also written that uh, the, uh, the death toll from this has probably been woefully underestimated. It's astonishing to me the degree to which we see the coronavirus through the prism 
of ideological convictions rather than as a public health threat. And the idea that wearing masks should be like a political badge that one wears as opposed to something you do for public safety, I think it's a sad reflection of the degree of polarization in the country. But at the end of the day, we can call this simply the flu, but it will still kill people at rates much greater than the flu. Uh, epidemiologists are quite convinced that there is a second wave coming. And I think that um, you know, as the toll rises around the country, as it reaches part of the country that have not yet uh, faced it directly, I think that our understanding of the virus will change, and I hope that that will galvanize people to act. And I think uh, that if people go to nytimes.com and read some of your earlier columns, they will find ways to actually change lives, uh, causes that they can contribute to and work toward that will uh, actually help people. Thanks to Nick Kristoff of the New York Times. And for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts. Thank you, Sam.